Can you guys hear me? At the back? Thumbs up. Yeah, okay. Um, I need to hold this. Welcome to CS Connect Media Technology. Um, this is the first semester we're offering this. Um, it was started last semester um, by a group of five or six people. Um, so you guys are part of the revolution of making near to education for uh, today we're focused on the big picture, so if you're thinking, you know, why should I enter this industry, should I um, look for internships in this industry, should I do research in your tech, um, this will be a good primer, so um, a quick summary of what's going on in the field, some of the key players, some of the key applications, um, things like that. Um, just a quick note, we have our info session for near tech at Berkeley right after this at 8 p.m. So our goal is to finish around 7.45ish, and then if you're interested in that, you uh, can walk with us over. So that will be 120B next time. So let's get the intros for now, we'll do that at the end, and we'll start with the fun stuff. Number one, what is near tech? So I like to think of it in three different ways. Number one is tech that allows you to understand the brain. So lightweight imaging and cranial surface measurements are two of the most popular examples. Um, there are, of course, other examples like CT scans, um, well, um, FNRIRS, which we'll talk about later. Um, the second category is doing stuff, technology that lets you do stuff to the brain. So neurostimulation, brain cell therapy, and implant technologies. So if you want the brain to behave in a certain way, then you would somehow stimulate it with electricity. Lastly, we have technology that lets you do stuff with the brain. That's the most exciting, in my opinion. Brain computer interfaces, so if you control a computer with your brain, um, they're both invasive and non invasive ways to do that, which we'll talk about as well. I also want to give some motivation for Neurotech because this is the first lecture and not everyone will show up again next week. Um, the first reason, hopefully, all of you are motivated by this is to save lives. If you're not, please talk to me after class. Um, so, neurological disorders cause approximately 9 million deaths every year, and they're the second leading cause of death after cardiovascular disease. Uh, number two, we really don't understand the brain at all. So there's a quote from a professor at Harvard University, um, Jeff Lichtman, and he said, if everything you need to know about the brain is a mile, how far have we walked in this lab? Three inches. So that's kind of sad to think about, but the bright side is that we can use technology to go farther and smile and understand the brain better. Lastly, um, transhumanism is the idea that humans can be enhanced with technology. So the truth is humans have a lot of problems and life sucks sometimes. Um, it's difficult to fall asleep. It's hard to focus after an hour. Um, you get tired easily. Um, so the goal of transhumanism is how can we use in this case, we have technology to enhance our abilities and kind of avoid these problems. Well, I'm going to put some recommended readings on the side. Um, you can do that later. Those are two of my favorite articles. Um, number one is from the blog post, We Put Why, uh, from Tim Irvin, who's a part of that. The second one is the Wall Street Journal. There's one more reason um, for going into near technology, and it's the one that I most often use when I'm trying to convince people to join. Um, it works most of the time. It's actually not my idea. It belongs to, well, ideas don't belong to anyone. But this idea was first made public by Josh Wolf. He's a partner at Love's Capital. Um, they're a VC fund that funded um, Control Labs, which is a company we'll talk about later. Um, and it's called the Half-Life of Technology Intimacy. Um, and it's basically an analysis of how computing form factors have changed um, over the past 70 years. So I'll get you guys started. 70 years ago, we had a collection. Does anyone know what computers looked like 70 years ago? About 1950? Yes. Like that. Um, yeah, too. Um, they were room sized computers and they were operated by researchers only. So the ENIAC, um, if you guys have taken 61C, you would have noticed this. Um, it's the first electronic general purpose computer. Um, has anyone watched Hidden Figures, the movie? Oh, yeah. yeah, so 
the first programmers of this machine were actually all women. 200 women were tasked with the uh, programming this machine. And programming this kind of plugging out wires and in different places. There was no code. Um, so this was the NEA. It took up an entire room. Um, obviously, it wasn't meant for households. Um, and then if you cut 70 in half, so let's look at 35 years ago. Does anyone know what happened 35 years ago? Actually, 36. But then the math doesn't work out. 1984. Yes, the Macintosh. So, and, and in general, desktops, right? I don't want to talk about Macs only. Um, the Macintosh came out in 1984. If you guys remember the really popular app um, that featured the book in 1984. Um, and the idea here is that now computers can block households. Um, and to control them, you have keywords, you have mice, I think. And um, you use your hands to control these keyboards. Um, they're still big, big, they're still clunky. Um, this is a significant improvement from 70 years ago. Yeah, yeah. 18 years ago? Anyone? Smartphones. Not smartphones, yeah. You have laptops. So now we've combined the computer, we've combined the mouse, and we've combined the keyboard, which is really nice. You can take this laptop anywhere. You can take it to a car, on a flight, um, to office, back home. Um, that laptop over there is insignificant. It's just a random laptop I found on the internet. Because um, when you search up first laptop, there isn't like a clear answer. Um, but that was 18 years ago. Let's talk about nine years ago. It's actually a bit more than nine. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So the iPhone came out in 2007, which was actually 13 years ago, but we're close enough. Um, now we have smartphones that are on your bodies now. So they're inside the pocket of your jeans. Um, to control them, there's no longer a physical keyboard. You have swiping, tapping, and pinching. Um, and we're referring back to the name of this idea of the half life of technology intimacy. Technology is now becoming more intimate, it's closer to you. Four years ago? Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Watch, <laughs> yes. um, we had the smartwatch. That was at least 2015, so a bit more than four years ago. So obviously this is more this is a more intimate version of an iPhone because now it's always on you. Uh, if you went at night if you're doing the sleep app. Um, you still control it the same way, so I think having the same thing. Um, I do want to mention voice assistants, that's also a thing that came around about, about this time. Um, but again, going back to the idea of technology is really more interesting. One more, two years ago? Glasses. No. You have smart glasses? Is it yes, you should tell me about it. Mm -hmm. It's not exactly a computer. It's a, just think Apple. Think intimate. What, what is? Yes. 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 Air phones. So those came out in 2017. Um, so now they're not in your pockets. They're not just on your wrist. Now they're in your tiny. They're in your ears. Um, and again, going back to the idea, technology is becoming more intimate. So now the question is, what's next? So take about a minute. Turn to your neighbor. Introduce yourself. Um, maybe put me all the water in this class and then put it in this class. Hi, what's my name? Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I'm a facilitator. Uh, I'm manning the camera. Uh, yeah. Are you guys are yeah. Uh, yeah, we're going to be like passing out. Yeah. 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 Uh, I'm going to be like passing out. Yeah. So, what do you think is going to be next? Uh, what do you think is going to be coming out recently? For sure. Smart. I don't know. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's like just straight up on your eyeball, that's like showing the screen. So it's 
like, uh, these things are like, it's getting closer and closer and closer. Yeah, so that's one thing. Smart shoes, though. I kind of like that. Yeah, yeah. That might be a good idea. Yeah. How many of you guys are there? Um, no, there's four. So I told it, and then there's like, um, more like, if we can, if we can, we didn't expect to see, you know, this many people, but, you know, we're going to be getting up the road, like, and hoping that, you know, it's easy. Oh, man. Yeah. 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 It's a good, it's a good problem to have. Yeah. Yeah. This is our first semester to do a decal, but we've all been involved in the time for people at the spot for like a year or so. so. Yeah. 
Yeah, voice activation is one. I think I'm looking for one more. Can you track your movements like we should be on a headset, your hands, in front of the glasses too? Yeah, exactly. So, well, actually, that wasn't what I was thinking of, but yes, you can have cam a camera in the glasses or in the contact lens that tracks your hands. Last one's, the one I'm looking for is related to hands or fingers, right? Yeah, so that's actually something we're going to talk about later. It's more neurotech related. There's a company that does that. Rings, uh, rings yes. More rings. Oh, someone said voice assistance. That was correct. So Amazon actually already has smart glasses that have limited capabilities to help echo frames. Amazon has a habit of coming out with things really fast, even though they're not ready, which is a good and bad thing. Um, they're called echo frames, and you control them exclusively with Alexa. There's no tapping, no touching, just Alexa. Which, as you can imagine, is awkward um, when you're out in person and you're like, hey Alexa, like, show me for my Uber. It's kind of awkward. Um, smart rings is what I was getting at. So, just recently, actually, Apple had a patent for a smart ring. Um, so you can imagine the ring being controlled with your taps, your swipes, force touches, right? Um, and it's a very discreet way of controlling the device. Really easy. So again, Amazon has the Echo Loop. It's the light still on your hand. Um, I believe you talk into it, but you can also swipe and stuff like that. But the more exciting one's on the right. But that's from a company called North. Um, North is based in Canada, and they make smart glasses. Well, on the left of the glasses, you see like a joystick. So that joystick steps over your index finger, and then you can control what you see with that joystick. But obviously, the holy grail is thought in good computing, so neurotech, right? So the ring, the voice, those are also little men. They're, they stand between you and the computer. Um, with thought in good computing, you think of something, and your intention is just like executed on the computer. Um, I want to be careful using the word thought, um, because we don't really know what thoughts are. That's something we'll talk about later as well. Um, but for now, we'll use this term. And obligatory me. So let's talk about some applications. Um, number one is stroke rehabilitation. So some quick facts. Well, first of all, what is a stroke? A stroke is when blood doesn't get to your brain when it needs it. Right? Put simply. I don't know if it's on the fly, but that's a quick definition. Um, some facts, every 40 seconds someone in the US has a stroke, and every four minutes someone dies of a stroke. Now the issue, um, as you see in the image on the right, is that when you have a stroke, your motor abilities are weakened. You lose a lot of your motor functionality, um, and you can't move your fingers, you can't speak, you can't move your legs, it depends on the stroke. So you need a nurse to help you rehabilitate. So you can exercise as displayed in the photo. Um, and the issue is that we don't have nurses to support strokes every 40 seconds. That's not common. You don't have that many nurses. So nurses are a limiting factor, which is for rehabilitation. Um, so now the question is, can we use technology? Can we not replace the nurse, but can we help the nurse, or can we allow patients to rehabilitate themselves, right? So there's one promising nurse solution. It's called motor imagery. Um, it's based on EEG, which we'll talk about later. Um, and what you do is you ask the stroke patient to rehearse um, some movement in their brains. So it can be a pinch of their index and thumb, it can be tapping the left foot, um, things like that. They rehearse that in their brains, so they don't actually execute that motion because they can't, right? Um, and then they're wearing an EEG cap, and that EEG cap detects these imagined movements, um, does some signal processing, does some ML. Again, I'm oversimplifying, <coughs> we'll talk about in a later lecture. Um, and then you can use these detected movements to provide visual stimuli to the stroke patient. So if the cap, if the EEG device detects that I'm pinching my index and thumb, then it's going to show me that. So when my brain sees that and thinks I'm actually moving my index and thumb, which I'm not, um, and that causes the motor neurons to fire, 
and then kind of slowly pay back that um, vulnerability. Um, and again, we'll talk about this technique later. Um, Recoverx is a startup working with this. Um, number two is neurological disorder treatment. Um, so there are four that we've highlighted here. Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, epilepsy, and depression. Parkinson's occurs when there's nerve cell damage to the substantia nigra. Um, and those cells that get damaged are responsible for producing dopamine. And dopamine is a neurotransmitter that regulates your movements. So when you use those cells, um, you see those tremors that you see in Parkinson's patients. Um, unfortunately, we don't know the cause of actually any of these disorders. We only have ways to diagnose them and like temporarily delete them on the least symptoms. So when it comes to Parkinson's, we have deep brain stimulation. So we place thin wires into the brain and those electrically they send impulses to an area of the brain called the basal ganglia. Um, and you can kind of control those more impulses with that electricity. Number two is Alzheimer's. Um, that occurs when neural pathways and brain cells die. And when that happens, um, the most common symptoms are memory loss and confusion. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with this. Um, there are ways to detect Alzheimer's with an MRI machine, a CT scan, a PET scan. Um, and if you want to treat it temporarily, or at least slow down the progression, there's something called transcranial electromagnetic treatment. And that's something we'll talk about later as well. Um, epilepsy, if you've seen a Kanye West music video, you know what that is. Um, <laughs> It's sudden recurrent episodes um, of the sensory disturbance. Um, EEG is a go-to way to diagnose epilepsy. And if you want to treat it, um, there's one go-to technique it's called vagus nerve stimulation. Um, so it's a device underneath your chest that stimulates the vagus nerve in your chest. It um, can kind of reduce those um, sensory disturbances. Lastly, depression. Um, I didn't want to put definition on this because there are multiple definitions. Um, and there are also multiple ways or theories of how you can treat depression, um, both neurotech and non neurotech. Um, so, stimulation is one of them, but again, it's something we're talking about in lecture eight or nine. Device control is the most exciting, in my opinion. Um, it's a transition from sci fi to sci fi, as some people say. Um, on the medical side, we have neuroprosthetics, so, there's someone who's the norm. Like arm, and they can control that arm and look at their, um, again, all these sort of thoughts, but it's usually more energy or EMG. Um, wheelchairs, so on the bottom left is actually a smart wheelchair created by uh, Nick Gill, third year tech club. They're better than us. Um, I'm not ashamed to say that, but they created a smart wheelchair, so it's simple to EG. Um, and then relying surgeons, so. Sometimes surgery is difficult when with a, with a human being um, you don't have that fine control that you might need with a robot. Um, so you can imagine some like in the very far future you can have a surgery controlling a robotic arm. Um, CMEF just came out with one in 2019, it's EEG controlled. Um, if you see the cap she's wearing, there are a bunch of electrodes on that. Um, so ideally this isn't ready for surgeons to use right now, um, but it's in the right direction. On the right side, we have commercial applications of device control, which is the most exciting, but that applies to us. So personal computer input, so typing and scrolling with your mind, smart home appliances, so imagining lines going up, go up, and then drones. Um, you'll notice that I don't have specific examples on the right of commercial um, device control is because it doesn't exist yet. Um, there have been attempts with issues that it's late. And if you give flaky mind control to users like us, you get very frustrated, right? If you've ever used autocorrect or space bar, it doesn't work. You get very frustrated, or else I do. Um, so we don't want to like destroy the market by putting out that technology. Um, big Enhancement, I believe, for last application. Um, so going back to what I said earlier, we as humans have a lot of problems that kind of suck. Um, we get tired, we get hungry, we get sleepy, we can't fall asleep, um, so we're not hungry. So the idea is can we use neurotype to enhance us? So that's going back to the idea of enhancing 
So in terms of sports, there's a company called Halo. Um, we might be bringing up later this semester to come talk to us. So if you're interested in that, stay on the lookout. Um, they make EDG headphones. So you put them on your head, most of music obviously, but on the top strap of the headphones are EEG electrodes. Not EEG, sorry, just electrodes. And those electrodes apply direct current to your motor cortex, and you can kind of stimulate motor cortex uh, and kind of enhance motor abilities. Um, they were being used by the Golden State Warriors for a period of time, and then apparently some of the scientists play like Kiesel inside. Um, apparently it hurts, so. <laughs> um, in terms of productivity, there is a company called Neurosity, which we brought to Neurotech at Berkeley um, last semester. I'll talk more about it later. They're an EEG company. It's a headset, which I have in this bag, that assists uh, focus and concentration. So it's targeted for software developers, actually. You put on the EEG headset, and while you're putting it, tell me how focused you are. If you're in a flow state, if you're not, go take a break, stuff like that. Um, in terms of memory, there's a company called Hong. They're based in Berkeley, they're funded by Skydeck. Um, and they, it's basically a forehead patch that you wear, and it expands your working memory by simulating beta waves. So this is another example of stimulation. Um, they'll apply alternating currents to your prefrontal cortex, and that's how they simulate the uh, beta waves. Um, sleep, there's a company called Dream. Um, not so much helping you sleep, that's a really hard problem that people are still working on. It's more about giving you sleep reports based on an EEG cap that you wear at night. Um, obviously, for it to be comfortable, there aren't that many electrodes, so of course it's going to be less accurate than it would be if you had more electrodes, but it's a step in the right direction. Lastly, meditation, there's a company called Muse. I also have the headset in this bag. Um, I guess I'll show up now because we're not talking about it later. We actually have like 20 of these. Um, this is a Muse headset. Um, you guys can actually pass it around. Um, and it uses EEG. Um, there's an app that you download and it plays rainforest sounds based on that one. And then the goal of the app is to um, get as many bird chirps. And the more bird chirps you get, the more calm. So it's technology assisted meditation. Some people don't believe of it, believe in it, but um, based in Canada. So challenges, I want to talk about a few. Number one is bandwidth. So before I talk about great computer interfaces, I'm going to talk about computers. So back in the day, transistors, which are paper transistors with switches, um, transistors were very big. And it was, yeah, you could only put a small number of transistors on and that limited the performance and speed of computers back then. And then people started putting transistors on their computer chips. And then Gordon Moore, the founder of Intel, he published this law that the number of transistors on a computer chip would double every 18 months. And so far that has held pretty true. Um, and now there's an analogous scenario when you, when you come to break on computer basis. Um, the question is, not about transistors, but rather about neurons. How many neurons can we listen to in the brain? So when you talk about neurotech, that's one of the biggest challenges. How, can you, how many neurons can you listen to individually? Um, right now we're about, if you look on the graph on the right, we're about 500 neurons. Um, nowhere close to how many neurons we have in the brain. Um, people have said that if you want to build a useful brain computer interface, that lets you perhaps scroll and type you would need to be able to record 100,000 neurons simultaneously. Um, if you want something world changing, maybe a million neurons. So if we follow Moore's law for neurons and we double every few months, then it will take us 2034 to reach a million neurons. Which is great, 2034 is almost here, one and a half decades. Um, but that's not what history has been telling us. So there is a scientist named Ian Stevenson. At the University of Connecticut, um, and he's plotted basically the number of neurons that we've been able to record since 1960. So he's been looking at papers so basically plotting like that. Um, and if you look at that trend, we're doubling every 7.4 years. So if we reach a million neurons, 
you have to wait for 20 of them. Most of us will be dead or almost dead. So um, that's unfortunate. So a lot of companies are working on, including Neuralink, how can we basically prove things wrong and how can we follow something closer to more as well. Um, just to reiterate, the more neurons that you can listen to, the finer um, information you have about the brain, what it's doing, so you can better understand what we're visualizing, what we are, our motor intentions, our speech intentions, um, things like that. Number two is implantation. So you can't commercialize brain surgery, right? Um, but the issue is if you don't build an invasive solution, then you can't get as close to neurons as you would like. And if you're not close to a neuron, it's hard to detect the action potential. Um, we'll talk about action potentials during lecture two, but just think of that as the neuron fire. Um, that's what I meant in the last slide, by the same neurons were listening to action potentials. Um, so, once again, if you want to listen to neurons individually, it's better to go invasive, but the issue is that we have a limited number of neurosurgeons, they um, are expensive, um, they're limited, and then the other issue is biological compatibility. So our brains don't know what electronics are. They shouldn't know. Um, so it turns out if you start putting electronics into your brain, it will cover the electronics and scar tissue. And then the electronics don't work anymore. So there's a lot of concerns about implanting devices into your brain, which is you make a small cello um, floating in water. Um, so one idea is you can insert these electronics where blood vessels previously existed. So that's one approach that people are taking. Um, but you also have to be careful about um, making sure these electronics are sealed um, so that they don't interfere with neurons, they don't um, break up brain tissue, things like that. Um, but as I said, in the bottom circle, bandwidth is the primary reason to build an invasive solution. There's a quote from Elon Musk on Neuralink. Um, we'll talk about Neuralink in a few slides. But he said that the machine to accomplish this would need to be something like invasive, an automated process. Because otherwise, you just get constrained by the limited number of neurosurgeons and the cost of very high. <coughs> you need a LASIK like a machine ultimately to be able to use that scale. So, LASIK, as some of you guys know, is like a fairly simple process. You walk in, you walk out. Um, it's not really surgery. So, the goal of Neuralink and other invasive companies is to make this procedure less than surgery and more like LASIK. So, you walk in and you walk out in very minutes. Neuroscience is our third challenge. We just don't know enough about the brain. Once again, we're three inches in, in the pile. Um, there are three critical problems that are unsolved that are relevant to neuroscience. Number one is disease. If you don't know the causes of Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, um, if you don't know the causes, then it's hard to use technology to treat them. Um, number two is movement. We don't really understand how movement works. So if you look at motor nerve impulses, they're actually very, very noisy. Uh, our movements are very fine and controlled. So where is the discrepancy there? Number three is cognition. We have no idea what cognition is. We have no idea what the neural basis of decision making is. Um, that's mostly a field tackled by philosophers. Um, and we don't really have any neuroscience backing for that right now. And obviously, if we can figure out what cognition is, we can build better technology, kind of listen to these decisions that our brain is making, um, things like that. Lastly, public skepticism and ethics. So this is a question for all of you. So Facebook, in, a few years ago, said they are coming out with a device that will let you type into your mind. So they said it would be out by 2019. It never happened, as all the neuroscientists predicted. It would not happen. Um, but let's say this does come out within the next few years. Talk to your neighbor. Would you use this? <laughs> I I don't think it would have to be invasive, but I think the like the key thing here is like what are they doing with the implants in the brain in the middle part, you know, from your head to the you know, so like I think I would still want to try it. It was like maybe with somebody else. Oh, you just went to Facebook. Yeah. Like Apple, I probably. Okay. Interesting. Okay. So it's kind of just like taking. Okay. All right. But if it was Apple, I guess you have like two directions. Okay. All right. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Hey, do it. Yeah. 
It's a wearable. No harm.
the claim is that small developers are rich and supported. Um, but what you do is you wear it, and they actually have a VS Code extension. Um, if you guys know what VS Code is, it's a terminal type of code, not D. Um, and on the, on the bottom right, it will display your focus, on your, your focus levels. Um, and that's on each path of the EV. Um, and then if your focus goes down, you're not in flow state anymore, they'll tell you, okay, so the speed will flash, and they tell you to get out and go do something. Um, and this is actually a developer kit that you guys put around. Um, it's the first iteration, so it's not yet commercialized, um, and there are very few of them. So we were lucky to get out the wait list um, and have access to it. Um, so let me do a quick demo. So the main the main point we use to do that thing is like focus and concentration. Um, if you try hard enough, you can train EEG to detect some movements. So going back to the idea of motor imagery, you can train it to detect finger pinches or foot taps. Um, and all you do is you can link that imagined movement to an action on your computer. So if I think of pinching my index and thumb, then the page will scroll down. If I think of tapping my left foot, then the page will go up. Yeah, so what's happening in that video is that 
you, you, you can just put it on and something will automatically have a train device to understand um, how your body works, how your neural neurons work. But over time, actually within minutes, you can train it so that instead of having, so first of all, you start tapping the button. Um, and then what happens is the wristband, the wristband is listening to this, and then it begins to associate the, the finger movement, the, the muscle fibers that cause that finger movement to the dinosaur jump. And over time, you can stop tapping. Uh, maybe you have to like still make the motion. Um, but then over time, you can stop making that motion altogether. Um, I included the video of the right. I'm not going to play it. It's just another Kiara video. Um, but I want you guys to be wary of the fact that of the word thoughts. We're not using thoughts to control anything. We don't know what thoughts are. We don't know where they exist in the brain. We are using EMG and we're using motor nerve impulses to control the dinosaur. We're not using thoughts. Now obviously a headline, control machines with their motor nerve impulses, that doesn't sound sexy. So they use the word thoughts. Um, but I just want you guys to be wary of that when you see these headlines as uh, so you're to the pocket. And they were acquired by Facebook in September 2019 for some amount between five million and one billion dollars. Um, can anyone tell me why Facebook would want this? Why would they want a device that lets control things um, without having to make any physical movements? Why would they pay most of a billion dollars? Sure, yeah. Type the website. So I'll give you a hint. It was bought well, it was bought for a Facebook reality lab, which is a condition under Facebook. Yeah. For the rift for controlling Oculus. Yes, exactly. So if you guys have seen Oculus demos, um, they first started off with you holding controllers in your hand, and that's how they tracked your hands. Um, now, they have a camera in the Oculus that tracks your hands. So now what they're hoping is you can get rid of the camera, you can get rid of the controllers, and you can wristband, and this wristband will know how you're moving. So I think I should play part of this video just to make sure that's clear. There's now a wearable that lets you control your computer with your mind. It's being developed by Control Labs, a Manhattan-based startup that's been Yeah, see that? Oh. There's now a So on the screen you see I got to give the system a go to see if it really works. First, I had to calibrate the sensors to my neural signals. It wasn't perfect, but the system was able to detect less injury emotions. So the screen knows how you move your hand, you know there's no camera, and you're not holding it. So you can imagine them putting it into a watch, perhaps. We don't know. But it's clearly important to pay attention. Great imaging. Um, there's a company called OpenWater. Um, run by um, a woman named Mary Lou Jepson. Um, they're based in San Francisco. She's a former Facebook Google exec. She led devices at Google, but also at Facebook. Um, and they're working on a novel brain imaging technique um, that uses red light and cooperative. So I'll play part of the video, um, but just to give you some backdrop, red light isn't harmful to us, it's all around us, so we can use this um, for optical imaging. And what you do is you shine red light through the body. The issue with red light though, when you shine through the body, through the flesh, or through the skull, is that the light scatters. And when light scatters, you can't focus on an individual thing. Like thing, it could be a, a tumor, right? It could be an individual neuron. So the question is how do you descatter the light? And that's what holography is. Um, so this isn't only a neurotech company. They're working on making a portable, portable medical imaging device. So we're going to need a massive MRI machine. Um, this is something that you wear um, or some body part that you can imaging. This is a really, really, really big deal. 
um, because this is a non-invasive solution, you're able to send to one individual neuron. Um, they listen to it by lighting it up and you see whether it fires or not. Um, I actually met her. This is like one of my greatest life <laughs> Yeah. Um, of course, you guys have heard of Neuralink um, by Elon Musk and a professor at the University of Washington a few years ago. Um, they are building flexible electrode threads. Uh, each thread has 32 electrodes. Um, and you're basically putting these threads on something called an array. So, going back to the analogy between computers and PCIs, when you talk about computers, you talk about transistors going on chips. When you talk about BCIs, you're talking about electrodes going on to arrays. So that whole sequence is all is how many electrodes can fit onto an array. Um, so we have arrays of 96 threads, so 30, 72 electrodes total, and they're inserted into the brain with micron precision. Um, so they've achieved two big things. One, these electron, uh, electron threads, and number two, the robot that inserts them at six, threads, six electrodes per minute. Um, you wouldn't be able to insert them with a human surgeon. Uh, you need more precision than that. So I've included some really good links. One to their paper, and second to their launch event. I highly, highly recommend you watch those and read those. Um, so you kind of understand your life beyond the <coughs> what they're doing um, and the challenges they're facing. Mary Lou Jepsen was criticizing them on Twitter. Um, the issue, and this is a, this is a viable and you say um, those threads take up space, they're, they're physical things, they take up space in the brain. Um, and when you take up space in the brain, there's not, there's not a lot of space in the brain to begin with. When you take up space and you're displacing tissue, you're displacing neurons, um, and that can cause mini strokes, that can cause scars, um, and that's not desirable, obviously. So there are concerns about neuron's approach. Um, the question is, can they make it, as Elon said, a sink like thing, or just walk in and walk out? Um, at the moment, they're, dri they're drilling laser holes into your skull, so it's not exactly um, a walk in and So there, there are doubts about your own, um, many of which are fair, um, but as we've learned, it's like lies to bet against Elon Musk. Um, so we'll see what that goes. This is the last one. I know that biosciences started from Berkeley um, by Jose Carmena and Michelle Marvis on the bottom right. The professor at Berkeley. Their big um, contribution was neural dust. So 100 micrometers silicon sensors um, about the width of the hair. Um, and there are sprinkles throughout the cortex. And then you have another small device that was 3 millimeters. It sits right beneath the skull. Um, and that device communicates with all these dust particles of ultrasound. Um, ultrasound is just high frequency sound that humans can hear, but machines can um, Obviously, you don't want sounds coming out of your brain, so that's why it's an ultrasound. Um, and these particles don't take up much space in the brain. So, going back to the neural example, you're not going to cause blood vessel eruptions, you're not going to cause scar tissue, you're not going to cause. Um, invasive brain conditions. Um, so obviously you still need some sort of procedure to, some sort of surgery to install these micro devices as well as the device that's underneath your skull. It's a promising idea. Um, they are on leave, I believe, right now. They're working on this company full time. Um, on the top right is kind of a zoomed in version of how the each individual touch part looks. Um, I'm going to read more there. We have some that will be with that. Um, so that's that. That's all the technical stuff I have. Does anyone have any questions? I covered a lot. Number one on the left is free to understand neuroscience. 
So letters two to four are exclusively devoted to neuroscience. How does the brain work? What signals does it produce? How do we image it? Um, and how do we understand what it's doing? On the right, um, there is also the tech aspect. We want you to understand how to use the CS to develop interfaces between computers and the brain. Um, so there is coding in this course. Um, and lastly, the big picture, which is the one of what we talked about today. How does how do neuroscience and technology go together? What's the whole point of neurotech? How does it change when we should be human? Um, why is this significant? Things like that. First policies of PREX. Um, I understand not everyone has coding experience. Um, so we will include a path of the account in the form of a Jupyter notebook. Um, on the attendance survey, which we'll set now, or the person last slide, um, we will ask you guys how many people have coded with that kind of work. So if it turns out that no one's coded with that kind of work, we'll probably develop a separate lecture just to come in. Um, we require a personal laptop, weekly homework, no homework today, don't worry. Um, we allow laptops and tablets for note-taking, things are printed from phones, like others, um, and no discussion in labs. Grading, 43% attendance, 70% homework, 70% presentation, and 43% by project. So I know what you're thinking, you can ditch all the homework and still pass this course. That's true, yes you can. But don't, because the whole point of this is to learn and more is going to help you learn. Um, the presentation we'll talk about later, as well as the final project. So we'll do introductions. Um, okay. Start? Oh, sure. I'm Amy. Hi. I'm one of the instructors besides those three down there. I'm manning the camera right now. But I'll be doing lecture four on brain imaging techniques. Hello, I'm Kyle. I'll be doing lecture two on macro neuroscience as well as micro structure. Hi, I'm Izzy. I'll be doing lecture three on micro neuroscience and other related lectures. Well, I'll do more lectures. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so we'll try to do one instructor per lecture just to keep the small people. So this is the rest of our education division. A little near to the other place. Okay. Most society slide. 